Hey, it's me, Tim Dodd. The Everyday Astronaut. This is the biggest live stream I think I've had since I've been doing live stream coverage like this. We're going to Mars today. We're going to Mars today. We're landing. This is really exciting. This does not happen very often, guys. As a matter of fact, since I've, I've been doing live streams like this for about a year and a half now, and to date, I have never covered a landing on another planetary body. Notice I say other planetary body because, of course, uh, Blue, Blue Origin and SpaceX are landing some of their vehicles. But this is the first time I'm here with you guys to help you uh, understand all of the stuff going on uh, during this Mars InSight lander. So this is a mission, a NASA mission, and JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, designed spacecraft manufactured by Lockheed Martin. They made this lander. It's called the InSight lander. I'm going to pull it up here for, for you guys here. Um, so this is, this is the InSight lander. I'm going to put me down on this corner. And uh, yeah, this is, it's, it's, notice I'm saying the word lander and not rover. We're so used to saying like Mars rover, Mars rover, rover, rover. This one is specifically a lander. It won't move once it's on the surface, and it has to be very still for a reason. It's mainly there to study the inside of Mars. This is the first time we're ever going to really, truly probe into the core of Mars and get temperature readings and things from uh, pretty far down, like five meters down. Uh, that's a good amount down. So that's about 15 feet for those of us metrically impaired. Um, and uh, that's great. It also has a really, really, really sensitive seismometer on it um, that's able to literally detect, um, <laughs> literally, it's, it's so sensitive it could detect a butterfly landing on it. That's how sensitive this is. So that's going to be measuring Mars quakes. And then the other thing is they're also going to be studying the wobble of the planet, uh, which is pretty cool. So this is, uh, this again, guys, if you are on my, going to my website to check out stuff, everydayastronaut.com. Um, this article is written by my friend Athena. Um, she's a contributor on Everyday Astronaut. And uh, yeah, there's some infographics here. There's, um, yeah, we kind of give you a good rundown on how this difference from differs from other rovers. So here, before we even get started, I wanted to, to show you guys, I got to see this rover or this lander in person in the clean room. Um, I wanted to roll that footage or should we talk, we could also talk about the launch of it because that was in May. Um, I did live stream the launch too, is the first interplanetary launch that ever happened from California. Because normally when you're leaving Earth's, when you're getting into orbit, it's, you know, if you're going equatorial, you gain some delta V by the Earth's spinning. You gain some energy by the Earth's spin. So if you're launching from the East Coast, you get some of that velocity and it gets put into your orbit. But they actually launched straight south, basically, um, from Vandenberg. And from a polar orbit, north and south, it was still able to get to Mars, no problem, which was the first time we've ever done that. So, um, yeah, this lander, by the way, people are asking when this lands, in about one and a half hours. So I have to entertain you guys and answer your questions uh, for about an hour and a half. So I'm going to roll this, this footage of when I got to go and actually see the InSight lander um, out in the processing facility in Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, this was part of a show. I did a show earlier this year uh, with Facebook for Facebook Watch uh, called Spacing Out. So it was actually produced um, by like other people. I was just kind of the talent. So if you guys uh, want to watch that, you can search Spacing Out on Facebook. Uh, if you are interested in seeing, there's five episodes. Um, but I'm going to show you guys a clip from that when I actually was able to see Insight in person. I had a lot of fun. It was really cool. And we're really official, where unfortunately my well worn spacesuit isn't allowed. Fun fact you need explicit permission to use NASA's logo. Yeah, we didn't know that either, which is why my shirt is blurry. Anyway, I have been granted special access to see the Mars InSight lander, which is scheduled to take off for the Red Planet on May 5th. 2018. But NASA doesn't want any of my invasive alien microbes anywhere near the hardware going to Mars. So I need to wear this super cool, super sterile outfit. Probably don't want any of me going to Mars. I'll see you on the other side. And go through this air shower to shake off any loose biology. So I can be in the same room with NASA's latest Martian research robot. I'm standing next to some Mars hardware. That's right. This is the Mars InSight lander. 
designed to conduct interior exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy, and heat transport. This baby is designed to study the red planet's deep interior. InSight's instruments will monitor seismic activity, track temperature to understand how much heat is flowing from beneath the planet's surface, and gauge how much the planet wobbles as it revolves around the sun, giving us a better understanding of what makes up the Martian interior. And I get to be in the clean room as it gets finalized for launch. I know it doesn't look like it, but this is about the most excited I've ever been in my entire life. I can't move around a lot because I might stir up some extra particles in the air and that might contaminate the spacecraft. And that's something I don't want to do and they can't let me do either. This is both amazing and terrifying. Now you see why they wouldn't let me wear my spacesuit, which by the way, has never been washed. Keeping an eye on me are scientists Tim Lin and Bruce Bannert. That's Bannert, not that Hulk guy, Banner. Still, I don't think I want to see this guy angry. Everything has to go right. You're taking a spacecraft that's coming in at about 12,500 miles per hour, Mars relative, and it's going to touch down about five miles per hour. Decelerating from 12,500 miles per hour to five. Even the Incredible Hulk would have a hard time with that. <laughs> Which makes the odds of pulling off a successful Mars mission... 50%, maybe a little bit above 50 now. 50%? That's a coin flip with a lot riding on it. Which brings me back to the point of all of this. Can Insight give right. us any so that's, insight? That was my experience with Insight. And to go there and see it in the clean room was... I mean, I was honestly, like, speechless for a minute. I had to sit there and, like, actually get in the zone because I was so... It's so cool to see... To me, okay, this is actually... This, this is not meant to cheapen it. This is meant to help explain, like, how exciting it was for me. It felt like I was inside real-life Kerbal Space Program, you know, because I'm seeing the lander legs and everything and the thrusters, and I'm just sitting there, like, picturing building it in Kerbal Space Program. Um, that's not meant to be an insult. That's meant to be, like, the ultimate, like, I was there in real life. Um, so it took me, honestly, a minute to, like, just get into the zone and, and think about the actual science that's going to be done on this mission. Um, and yes, I am aware, <laughs> as you guys point out, uh, the show couldn't use the NASA logo. And then as soon as it said explicit permission to use the NASA logo, I may or may not be drinking from a NASA mug. But that is because today is a NASA mission. It's time to sport the NASA mug. Um, I, th I think it's legal to, to drink from a, a cup on a live stream. But who knows? Who knows? <laughs> So the landing, guys, is at, um, let's see, my stream started at 1830 UTC, so I believe it's about 20 UTC is when this thing is going to land. We're going to be tuning into the NASA official live stream, uh, which starts at about 19 UTC, so in about 20 minutes, we will be streaming into that, listening to that. You know, there's a lot for me to learn on these things, but I did want to compare, um, the other thing we need to do here, um, I wanted to compare all of the other landers and all of the other objects on Mars, so let me pull this up for you guys. Um, so these, so, so far guys, we haven't had the best luck, humanity that is, has not had the best luck landing on Mars. It's really, really, really hard. So here's a list of artificial objects on Mars. Um, all of these were landers except for right now there is the remains of a Mars climate orbiter that, uh, that re-entered, but everything else is an intended lander and only the green ones are ones that are still active. And the other um, yellow ones are ones that, like, hmm, what are they? Oh, yeah, they're ones that were active, but then, you know, their life ended. So notice that we had, we were supposed to have the, the, the Schiaparelli lander um, in 2016, but that ended up about three, or is about five kilometers above the surface or three miles above the surface. <laughs> it thought it landed, so it, it basically, like, detached from the parachute early. Started, it, what happened was it had like a saturated numbers in its, in its computer. It oversaturated it and gave it a negative number for its altitude. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm, oh, I, I'm about to touch down or I did touch down. So it deployed its landing legs, fired its thrusters for three seconds instead of 30 seconds, and then just stopped. And then basically fell out of, this, <laughs> fell out of the Martian sky for like, yeah, five kilometers. Uh, and then it impacted at like, I think it was almost 500 kilometers an hour or something. So... Whoops, that was the last attempt that we've had something landing on Mars. We were also, this um, uh, InSight was supposed to land in, or launch in 2016. It did not. 
Uh, it had a problem with the seismometer that I believe ESA built. Um, and it ended up having a problem. So it got delayed two years now. So that delay costs like $150 million. But altogether, the, the InSight Lander is not uh, that expensive of a mission. Uh, it came in still well under a billion dollars, which is pretty cheap to get to Mars and do some good science. Um, so let's go through this here real quick. The first time we ever, anyone ever sent anything um, to try to land on Mars was Mars 2 by USSR. Well, I guess Mars 1 was probably the first thing to, to try to land on Mars. It probably just didn't get it. I probably should have thought about that. <laughs> um, but the first thing to successfully actually touch down was, uh, was Mars 3. And then we have uh, Mars 6. Viking 1 and 2 were very successful from the U.S. Um, the first rover. So look at this. Though. This is an interesting gap. 1976 was the last time the United States landed something on Mars. And then we went 21 years before we sent another orbiter or another lander. And this was the first rover. It was just in the 90s that we actually sent something with wheels on it to Mars. That seems... Like a really, really, really long time. I, I can't believe it took that long for us to actually send something with wheels to Mars. And that was, of course, Mars Pathfinder and Sojourner, which later got uh, renamed. The The actual uh, home base got relan renamed to, like, the Carl Sagan um, home base of fun or something like that. Um, and then look at this. So then, of course, we have, you know, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh which spirit died opportunity we thought last time i was streaming we thought we were hearing from it it's still considered operational although we don't have communication with it right now um it hit a had a dust storm and after what 14 years of being on the surface it was supposed to last 90 days and it's been there for 14 years so um yeah we if it dies now i think it did okay i think it you can go to sleep if you want opportunity you've done a great job <laughs> Um, and then here's the interesting 2008 Phoenix landed. Now Phoenix is almost exactly like, um, like the insight they're, they're, they're twins. They're both built by, um, by Lockheed Martin. They're both the same three legged lander concept. They both basically are the same lander with different instruments on top that saved money. Um, and since it's a proven system, since Phoenix went well and did his job perfectly, uh, that hopefully means we have a good, you know, really good luck on this lander today because we've already proven it with Phoenix. Phoenix worked great and here comes Insight hopefully to repeat that same success. This is going to be the same thing that happens. Uh, we landed Curiosity in 2012 and the Mars 2020 rover uh, is the same platform again just like Curiosity but it's kind of like Curiosity 2.0. So this is the another time where we're using the same landing idea and boop de boop. Um, yeah, so I think that's cool. Um, so there we go. Uh, like I said, Scaparelli was the last one to try to land. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff. I do want to say real quick uh, a hi and thanks. Um, thanks to everyone in the super chat. Uh, thanks Andrew, Chris, David, and Cami. Thank you guys so much for your for your tips. Um, and just for everyone wondering, yes, uh, Iowa. <laughs> most of Iowa got absolutely destroyed. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks, Mister Mao. Like having a little lander history before the landing. Good, because I, I love this stuff, and it helps remember how rare this stuff is, how hard it is, and, uh, oh, I also wanted to show you guys where all the landers are, because that's a, a good graphic to look at, too. Um, but yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Mao, and Keith Oudwater. Uh, love the videos and your work. Even though it doesn't look special to normal people, this will be a big step. How important do you see this mission 1 to 10? Because to me, it's a solid 10. I say, as far as importance, it's a 10. I mean, anytime we can get new data from a, another body outside of Earth and, and even the moon, the moon's great, but outside of our Earth-Moon system, you know, this is a big deal. Landing anything on Mars is a big, big deal. So, therefore, it's a 10. But as far as total significance, like in the grand scheme of history, of course, this is a historical and really great mission. But it's not like a, it's not humans on Mars. It's not a... You know, first landing of, you know, Curiosity was a big step because it was physically huge. So that was a little bit more significant. This is kind of like a, you know, like I said, this is almost Phoenix 2.0 in a sense. So as far as like total scheme of, of historical significance, it rates, you know, up there like eight or nine. But it's not a 10 in that sense, in my opinion. Um, but do doesn't mean it's not an extremely, extremely exciting. Um, yeah, I, these, these missions are absolutely insane. 
I am very excited. And by the way, you can see where everything's landed. Um, if I remember right, Phoenix, why isn't it on this? Are these ones that didn't make it? Uh, where's Phoenix? Phoenix landed up here, I thought, in the polar region. Oh, maybe that's just what they're saying. Oh, it's an interactive map. Yeah, that is Phoenix. Um, so Phoenix landed the last time this landing platform, it landed on, on the poles. It landed on the North Pole. Um, and there, and it didn't last as long because of the extreme temperatures. It didn't survive the Martian winter. Um, so this, this is going to be right on the equator. They did that so they can have a little bit longer lifespan out of it. Um, and it's awesome. So also thank you, uh, Alessandro. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, now one more thing I wanted to mention that I think is actually, this gets me surprisingly excited guys. Um, there were two cube sets that are flying kind of in tandem uh, to Insight on this mission. They ejected from the Centaur upper stage of the Atlas V. Um, soon after liftoff, you know, on its way to Mars, they they released two of these CubeSats. Now, CubeSats to Mars might not seem that exciting. At least, it, in general, I wasn't like, you know, oh, a CubeSat. CubeSats, I have a hard time getting too excited about most of the time, just because they seem, they can seem insignificant when they're small, and all of that should be exciting because they're small, lightweight, and they can do incredible things. The reason I'm super excited about um, about the uh, Marco, so basically the Mars uh, communicator, Mars Cube 1 and Mars CubeSat, or A and B, I think they're called. Um, the reason why these are awesome is they hopefully, and I, so far they're working well, will be able to provide basically real-time telemetry back to Earth uh, of this InSight landing. So they aren't going to even go into orbit. They're just flying by Mars. They don't have enough, propul you know, any kind of propulsion system that can put them into orbit around Mars. That's not their job. Their job is just to, you know, they're coming by Mars at the same time as InSight. And InSight can relay information up to these little CubeSats. And hopefully these CubeSats can get that information all the way back to Earth, even though they're a, the size of a briefcase. These are tiny, and yet they're, you know, you can almost think of them as like a disposable one-way phone for Mars or something. And this is different because normally, so say these don't work. These are not at all mission critical. These are a, a technology demonstrator. And say these do work, we'll get data back right away, like eight minutes later, as, <laughs> which is great because if it goes to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, it can be delayed by up to an hour because the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has to bring it in, ingest it, and then spit it back out to the Deep Space Network. Um, it just takes longer to get here. So uh, this is exciting because we'll have this. To me, this is really big uh, implications even for humans. Because imagine if the first human mission doesn't have its own relays and its own communication band. And we have to wait an hour to know if people landed on Mars and were like just sitting there like absolutely terrified of whether or not they made it. This hopefully will demonstrate that we can provide our own temporary communication band per each landing. And since they're CubeSats, they don't take up. You know, these things are tiny. I don't forget how heavy they are, but they're not big. You know, like I said, yeah, about the size of a briefcase. Uh, they're only like a couple kilograms or something. They're, it's amazing they can get that kind of power out of something so stinking small. And to me, this is uh, very, very, very awesome. Um, so, yeah, so again, uh, in our Discord, um, TWPSYN has the question of, the CubeSats have already separated. Yes, he and he. They thought um, they were being deployed in Mars orbit. Nothing is actually going into orbit on this mission, believe it or not. They're going direct descent to the surface. So, um, so basically, starting way back here at Earth, we aimed pretty much like just at Mars, a little bit beyond it. So the CubeSats won't get into the atmosphere. They're free from hitting the atmosphere. But inside itself is whoo, nailing it right through the atmosphere, which is just insane. Uh, I'm like, I'm nervous. This stuff is, it's scary, guys. I mean, we're talking about an $800 million mission. <sighs> my heart, my heart, it was crazy high for Rocket Lab recently. And uh, it's crazy high right now, just thinking about, we're, we're coming up, we're, we're about an hour, we're 70 minutes away. Uh, yeah. And real quick, I wanted to, quick thank you to David. Uh, thank you. And Paul, you, you want Corn Rocket merch? someday I will do corn rocket merch because you guys all have been asking me for corn rocket merch and uh Horan, uh thank you you're welcome for all the great videos you're welcome um so just so everyone knows too the other thing that's crazy about this stuff we're gonna have what's called the seven minutes of terror 
I don't know if you guys have ever heard that. Um, oh, RS wants to know, do I think, um, oh, and Dennis, yeah, we could do, we could do that too. Um, but Dennis and RS, I, I think this will be a success. We've already launched, like I said, we've already launched a mission almost exactly like this with the Phoenix Lander and it went great. So it's a proven technology. That's always the scariest part is when you start from scratch and you, for instance, the Curiosity Lander was like, we had no idea. That had a crazy sky crane system. This is a lot more, we've already proven it. It's, the sky crane was like this, the craziest idea I've ever heard. Uh, if you don't remember, Curiosity came in with the heat shield. Uh, then it, you know, it slowed down quite a bit with just using um, compressed air as it flies through the atmosphere, it slows down um, with the atmosphere. And then it deployed in a parachute for a while. And then it actually basically did like free fell and had this sky crane um, propulsive landing thing that then on a long rope lowered Curiosity. As soon as it sends touchdown, it flew away so it didn't crash onto the Curiosity rover. This removes that step, basically. These are, since it's just a small lander, it's just going to land on its own with no crazy sky crane mechanism. And we've already demonstrated this exact technology on the Phoenix lander. So I have a pretty high hopes of the success. Um, I'm going to look up the um, uh, things in orbit around Mars, and we'll talk about those um, around Mars. And we'll see if there's a list of Mars orbiters. Here we go. Good old Wikipedia. Here we go. So here's a list of all of the things around Mars right now. Now notice that so some of these uh, no longer are in it, uh, alive. But we still have one, two, three, four, five, six things around Mars. Um, that can, Some of them can relay information. Again, like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter can relay information. Um, yeah, so there's... That's not a lot. There's not a lot of human-made stuff on the surface or even around Mars. Mars, although entirely inhabited by robots, pretty low population count. Really quite low population count. Um, this is... Uh, someone asked if this is crew or cargo. Um, it, I think we'd... No, I'm not trying to make lightly of your question. That, that is a, a valid question. But if this was the first people landing on Mars... I think everyone would be out in the streets going crazy. This this would be bigger than the Apollo landing. When we do land people on Mars, I mean, there's going to be fireworks going off everywhere and everyone just huddled around, you know, Times Square and all these other places. So this is a just, it's not even cargo. This is just a scientific lander going to Mars. So, um, and again, I believe that it's not going to land uh, for another hour and seven minutes. I've had some people saying it's landing in 10 minutes. That's not true. Um, yeah. So we will be seeing a video of uh, mission control. I'll be pulling that up when NASA goes live here in seven. NASA's live stream goes live in seven minutes. I'll pull that up here for you guys. And Plastic Pinocchio, thank you. Yay, I'm late. Appreciate the commentary as always. Greetings from Italy. Thank you. Good old Plastic Pinocchio. Always around. And Paul... How is the time delay going to affect the stream? Will we be able to watch it live, How, but with a seven minutes away? What's with seven minutes of terror? So, okay, there's a little bit of confusion here. So, first off, there is no live streaming from Mars. There's not enough throughput. There's not enough data uh, bandwidth to be able to actually send a video signal live to Earth, at least with our current infrastructure. Maybe someday with better satellites and better blah, 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 we'll be able to actually do live streaming like that. Um, the seven minutes of terror is the actual time the vehicle is going through the re-entry sequence so it does like three minutes of just arrow breaking with the arrow shell um let me see if i can just pull i'll just pull watch this seven minutes of terror i believe uh the bbc has or not the bbc nasa jpl has a a good little thing so this is this one's for curiosity but it's similar to curiosity um it's going to be approaching at like twenty thousand kilometers an hour um twelve thousand five hundred kilometers or miles an hour for Insight, a little different uh, trajectory, apparently. Um, so it is in a similar heat shield capsule like this. Oh, you guys aren't even seeing this. Sorry. Um, so here we go. Yeah. So again, this one is, this is the seven minutes of terror for curiosity, not for insight, but it's very similar. Um, so it will go, it will scrub off about 10, 10 times its velocity or, or how would you say that? It'll get down to one tenth of its speed just through arrow breaking 
Um, so again, the Curiosity rover went from 13,000 miles an hour, so like 23 kilometers an hour, 22 kilometers an hour or so, 22,000 kilometers an hour. Um, so, th okay, then it, sl it, sc it slows down a lot, then it pulls a parachute, that slows it down a lot more. Again, I believe another, like, down to one-tenth its original velocity, uh, or the velocity of the aero brake. And then for the inside, it's just going to drop straight out of there. Now, this whole sequence takes seven minutes to do from beginning of reentry to soft touchdown, hopefully. So that's why that's called seven minutes of terror. So again, that's not going to be live streamed. That's not going to be um, the scientists will be looking at data because there is not enough like video. There's it's only like 7K per second uh, that they can actually send from the surface of Mars. We just don't have the infrastructure to send any kind of video feed like that. Um, we can upload videos eventually. These, like, it takes forever because they're just, like, frame by frame by frame by frame over, like, days to get little video clips like you may have seen. Um, but scientifically, that's not very valuable. There's a lot more data and, and value from other things. Um, but then there's also currently about an eight-minute delay from Earth to Mars just from the speed of light and, and the speed of communications. is about an eight-minute delay right now. So there's seven minutes of terror for the landing, and then about an eight minute delay. Uh, yeah, I hope that's so once it touches down, it will be down for eight minutes before we here on Earth really, truly know what happened. Um, I hope that makes sense. Let me know if that's confusing. So, um, yeah, by the way, <laughs> 7K per second. Yeah, it's very bad. Yeah, there's no airbags on this one. Um, this is a straight just lander. Whoop. Actually, watch this. Why don't we pull up? Oh, guys, I'm silly. We could probably just... I know that NASA has a InSight landing video. Why don't we watch that real quick? InSight lander. We'll just watch the... Uh, <laughs> the NASA one. NASA? Um, and by the way, this is... like Technically speaking, this is a very boring mission. Not to quote Elon Musk and the Boring Company too much, but this is going to be uh, a mission that bores Mars. So here we go. This is, uh, this is, oh, not even the animation of the landing. Ah, Tim, oh, you messed up. Yo, the internet's going to judge you. Okay, let's find the landing. Uh, landing animation. I could pull up the Phoenix landing animation. Here we go. Landing on Mars. This is Lockheed Martin's video. Um, this one will probably be great because I love Lockheed Martin. And I'm not saying I don't love NASA. But, um, yeah. So this will show kind of the seven minutes of terror. Yeah. So uh, this stuff is crazy. <laughs> Death awaits 87. Did they double check the metric in Imperial measurements? I sure hope so. Um, okay, yeah. So Daniel S. By the way, thank you for your for your tip. And um, yes, this is how exactly the land. We'll watch the EDL here. So <laughs> nice. Okay, so here we go. So at this point, yeah, it just said it's going to be relaying off the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. There's the little insight. Just a cute little, cute little thing. It's pretty small. I don't remember how heavy, but it's it's surprisingly small. But that does not mean it's not mighty. So that was just the, the thing that uh, provided during the whole six and a half month coast to Mars. Uh, it had its own little guidance and propulsion system. Now here it is re-entering. Again, it gets really hot uh, due to the compression of the, of the Martian atmosphere. Although the Martian atmosphere is crazy thin, it is going really, 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 really fast, and they go in pretty steep uh, to slow it down a lot. So it's very similar to Earth reentry in that case. And now they pop a parachute, and that keeps it stable, you know, keeps it pointed in the right direction, but also, of course, scrubs off a lot of velocity, at which point it will detach the heat shield. The heat shield will fly away, and uh, boom, they deploy some landing legs. Now it's going to drop from the heat shield, and it immediately fires up its thrusters. Now it does a propulsive landing, just like we see sometimes here on Earth with, with SpaceX and Blue Origin and like Mass in Space and some of these other people that are, that are really mastering propulsive landing. This is using that same type of idea. You use thrusters, kind of like a, a quadcopter, like a drone where they, they can change 
the pitch yawn roll uh using only thrusters and ta-da hopefully it touches down nice and soft i believe they won't open the solar panels for about 16 minutes to make sure the dust settles because that's definitely something they don't want to do nasa is live we're going to go live to nasa um we're going to pull up their stream they'll probably be talking a lot more about it um yeah there you go so um one last thing i did want to make sure you guys know that my new web store Currently, this is the last day of 25% off for uh, for Cyber Monday. Uh, use the code go for liftoff That's capital G O letter number four. Liftoff and uh, take 25% off everything in my web store. These shirts, the Buran, we decided to sell them through November 30th. So get these while they can. We've sold out and had to like remake a whole bunch of them already. Buran shirts. And uh, now my music After is available live too. Space for so more check it out here. Six All right. months and crossing 300 and million miles, InSight has reached its destination, the red planet Mars. Welcome to oh Mission God. Control at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on Dingy okay. Hill. Less than an hour from now, InSight will begin the most harrowing six and a half minutes of the entire mission, EDL, Entry, Descent, and Landing. The team is as prepared as it can be, but... Who knows what Mars has in store today? The crew's mission support area is filled with engineers monitoring the situation. And for the first time during a Mars landing, you can be in the room too. We have a 360 degree camera in this control room, allowing you to experience the landing right along with the team. There you see it. And to look up the link, just go to the Insight Watch page you see there on the screen. And this mission has actually two control rooms. The second is at Lockheed Martin Space outside of Denver, Colorado. Engineers there are on Console 2. Plus, people all over the world are tuning in at museums and libraries and other locations, including this one at the Pasadena Convention Center. And that is where friends and family are watching right now. There will also be an opportunity to watch in New York City. There they are cheering. There will be also an opportunity to watch in New York City when landing coverage gets displayed on the NASDAQ tower you see there in Times Square. And, of course, if you are watching, please snap a picture and share it with us using the hashtag Mars Landing. We'd love to see it. Now I'd like to introduce you to NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, Thank you for coming. Oh, it's my honor. We are Thank you for so having me. so excited to have you here. Great to be here. So this is your first Mars landing. It is. In this job. Now, I've, right. I, I have witnessed these as, a, I should say, from the sidelines for many years. Um, this is going to be the eighth time that we have a successful landing yep. on Mars. Nope. Everybody knock on wood. That's right. Um, but uh, this is the first time for me to participate as the administrator. So it's excited, very exciting. Nervous? Very much. Not nervous. Not excited. nervous. Look at Very the amazing good. people here. Yeah. There's no Very way I could be good. nervous. All right. So we hope to have you back on set after landing and yep. maybe take a couple of social media questions. Absolutely. All right. If you would like to ask the administrator a question, use the hashtag <laughs> ask NASA. And before you go, you did ask about the Lucky Peanuts. Yes. So this is your bottle to take in there. Happily munching on these. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Now let's give you some background. Inside, in short, is short for interior exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy, and heat transport. It's different from other Mars missions, which all studied the surface. Insight is the first mission to study the interior of the red planet. The basic uh, idea of Insight I am is to map right out the deep structure of Mars. We know a lot about the surface of Mars, we know a lot about its atmosphere, and even about its uh, ionosphere, but we don't know very much about what goes on a mile below the surface, much less 2,000 miles below the surface down to the center. And this will be the first mission that's going to Mars specifically to investigate the deep inside of Mars. We know that the Earth is habitable, we know that Mars is not. There might be something that we find out in terms of the structure of Mars versus the structure of Earth that maybe can help us understand uh, why that is. InSight carries a seismometer which measures the seismic waves that have traveled through Mars from Mars Come on. and maps out the deep interior structure of Mars. We're going to also have a heat flow and physical properties probe which will penetrate into the Mars surface about 5 meters or 16 feet. 
to take Boring. the temperature of Mars. Just kidding. Get in. And it has a, a radio science experiment which uses the radio on the spacecraft to measure small variations in the wobble of Mars's pole to understand more about the structure and composition of the core. InSight will be the first mission to pick instruments up off the deck of the lander and place them on the surface of Mars. I like to say that we're playing the claw game on Mars with no joystick. The seismometer needs to be installed in one place and basically not move in order to get the best seismic data. We also have a wind and thermal shield that will then be placed on top of that seismometer to protect it further from the environment. For the heat flow probe, HP cubed, it also needs to sit in one place, take a while to hammer itself down into the ground and acquire the thermal measurements over a long period of time. InSight is a mission to Mars, but it's much, much more than a Mars mission. In some sense, it's like a time machine. It's measuring the structure of Mars that was put in place four and a half billion years ago so we can go back and understand the processes that formed Mars just shortly after it was accreted from the solar nebula. By studying Mars, we'll be able to learn more about Earth, Venus, Mercury, even the Moon, even exoplanets around other stars. Landing on Mars is always difficult. More than half the missions have failed. Our experts in this field are systems engineers for entry, descent, and landing. They speak EDL. Let me introduce you to two in our control room, Christine Soleil, who will be making the mission callouts during landing, and Julie Wurtz Chen. She is our color commentator who will help explain mission operations. Christine, let's start with you. I understand that there was a final software update and adjustment. What does that mean? That's right. Yesterday we sent the last EDL software parameter update to the spacecraft's computer. This update told the spacecraft exactly when it will hit the top of the atmosphere and also fine-tuned things like when to deploy the parachute. This EDL software is very important because InSight uses this software to perform entry, descent, and landing completely on its own. Mars is so far away from Earth that when a command is sent from Earth, it takes about eight minutes for it to reach the spacecraft. Entry, descent, and landing from start to finish is less than eight minutes long, so InSight has to do this all by itself. All right, its fate is sealed. Now I understand that, that the team is about to do a readiness poll. Julie, can you fill us in on that? Sure, so that's gonna be a poll between our EDL communications engineer and several of the different orbiters and antennas that we have here on Earth. So we have Marco listening in on us, and MRO, which is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, will be listening to our data and recording it for us. And then the radio science uh, engineers will be eavesdropping in on our signal from all the way back here on Earth. And Sandy, our EDL communications engineer, will be checking in with them, making sure that they're all ready to go, ready to support us in just a little, you know, under an hour to land on Mars. All right, so we're standing by for that, for that yep. readiness poll. And I understand that the peanuts are going to be passed in there pretty soon? I believe that's, the, that's the idea. Yeah, we'll be passing around the peanuts very soon after that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the JPL peanuts are a, a tradition that gives us a little bit of extra luck on our critical events. So if anybody out there wants to join in on peanuts and give us some extra good, good luck peanut vibe, we'd love to have it. Well, there's a story behind that, that way back when in the early days of JPL, there were several missions and uh, there were six Ranger missions to the yeah. moon that failed. Yep. But then with Ranger 7, Ranger seven somebody, some, somebody passed around peanuts. Yeah, yeah, and it worked. And you don't mess with what works. So <laughs> Absolutely. It's not a superstition, it's a tradition. All and right. uh, we just give ourselves that little bit of extra luck. All right, so you have, if you have peanuts at home, Please have some. That's right. All right. That's right. Thanks, us. Julie. Thanks. NASA has had seven successful Mars landings, but the EDL team never, ever becomes overconfident. JPL Chief Engineer Rob Manning says things have to work just right during six and a half critical minutes. So we kind of already talked about this a little bit. Um, let me know. I saw some really, really... This video is available online. I watched it earlier. So if you guys want to watch that... Um, I want to answer some of your guys' questions. So, um, first of all, my friend Trevor Malman had a really good question um, that he just tweeted. 
Uh, what if the crane breaks? Is there a backup? Um, can some of the instruments work on the deck? Um, I think it works like this. At this point, you know, everything has to work on these missions. They can't have the parachute not work. They can't have, uh, you know, the, the landing gear not work. They can't have the propulsive engines not work. The crane is just another thing that I think it just has to work. And that's part of mission success. Um, you know, because the, the probe, obviously, there's a little thermal probe. That has to be on the surface of Mars. That does not work. If it's on the deck, also the seismometer, I believe they've, they tried to do that in other missions from the deck, but unfortunately it's so sensitive. It's just reading the vibrations of the spacecraft. So they want to set it down on the, on the ground. I also saw someone else asking about, um, won't the seismometer just be reading the probe going down? I'm sure they'll take that into account and only take readings between like probe core deepeningness. Yeah, and just a friendly reminder for everyone, we're 49 minutes away from the landing sequence, from hopefully. So everyone keep your fingers crossed here. And I did want to say, too, the Peanuts thing. Um, I don't know how I feel about superstition and, and the science here. Ooh, we had the stream cut out here. Um, let me refresh this real quick. Um, hopefully that's not on NASA's end. Um, but I, I don't know how I feel about mixing superstition with science like this. To me, it just seems a little bit like why do that really but that's just me maybe um as someone that i want people to to understand that this isn't due to luck this is due to great engineering this is due to a lot of things that that peanuts have nothing to do with really i get that it's kind of fun i just hope that people don't take weight in the superstition aspect of you know things like vests and like certain clovers and things like that i get it it's fun but let's obviously not detract from the engineers the hardworking scientists, the people that actually make this stuff happen. To me, that's what matters. And that's really, you know, what's the different, you know, people eating peanuts at, at Mission Control have no effect on a spacecraft, you know, 20 million or 200 million kilometers away or however far away it is right now. Um, so let's just kind of keep that in mind and, and be cheerful of the hardworking engineers that, that make all this stuff possible. So, um, yes. So... I'm excited, guys. I'm really excited for this. Oh, and I need a real quick thank. Oh, dang. Um, well, thank you. Wow, guys. Chris and 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 Ziegel and Matthew. I'm um, thank you for thinking that the my stuff is is good. Thank you. And Primus and Tori, you're welcome. I'm so excited to be streaming this. And uh, Damasis, um, I'll try to link that 360 feed. And thank you, Andrew and Ryan. I'm going to get back to her. Though, the program. Right. Meantime, let me introduce you to someone who has been working on Insight for seven years. He's the project manager, Tom Hoffman. Seven years, and today's the day. That's right. Seven years, but we're just a little over you know, 40 minutes now, and we're going to be on the surface. It's going to be awesome. Really exciting it's stuff. All worth it. All right, so let's talk about Insight. It's using tried and true technology. It's based on Phoenix. This time, there's a bigger challenge with communication, correct? Normally, we have an orbiter that can give us bent pipe communications, but it's different this time. That's right. And most of the time when we've landed recently, we've had Mars Odyssey, which can do bent pipe communications. And so we get real-time data as we go through EDL. And we've come to expect that and actually we really, really want that. Um, in this case, our primary technology, primary orbiter is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so what that's going to be doing is actually will be listening to us on the UHF. If you go to the video, you can see this. Uh, MRO will be listening to us and be getting all the primary data, and it will send it back to us, unfortunately, only at three hours after we land. So it doesn't give us the bent pipe live information It, it doesn't. As it we happens. have a couple of other sources that we're looking at. We have a Green uh, Bank Observatory in West Virginia. Max Planck Observatory in Eppelsburg, Germany, which will be giving us UHF, but those only give us a couple of different points in time. And so we did something kind of cool this time. Uh, we brought along a couple of CubeSats called Marco, and so hopefully they, they're both working great today. Oh, fantastic. So we're hoping that they're going to continue to work all the way through EDL, and they will be giving us uh, real-time feed. So we can show how that works on the next uh, video there here. They are. So you can see here's InSight with its crude stage, getting close to Mars. But we have two stalkers following us. They've been following <laughs> us since we launched. They launched on the same launch vehicle as us. 
And so you can see the green there is we're sending UHF signals to them. And then they turn that around and send a much stronger signal back to Earth. We can't communicate on UHF direct to Earth with a signal that tells what's going on in the spacecraft, but Marco can. If it works for us all the way down to the surface, we're going to have some great information coming from Marcos. So Marco is basically trying to fill that gap that we would have had if we had... So I want to actually answer some of you guys' questions about this, because we talked about this a little bit earlier at the beginning of the stream. And this is, this is really exciting technology. They took with them two small CubeSats to hopefully, these are tiny, these are like briefcase sized CubeSats called Marco A and B. And they're not going into orbit of Mars. They're literally just cruising by because since they aren't re-entering the atmosphere, they aren't going to be you know, put into orbit or obviously they won't be landing on Mars. They're just flying by at the same time since they came from the same like launch as the, as the InSight lander. They're flying by at the exact same time and they're there to hopefully relay the signals directly in this bent pipe uh, directly relay the information back to us here on Earth just out of a briefcase. Something the size of a briefcase in space is powerful enough to relay the information so we can get real-time data. Otherwise, we're going to be waiting on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, if these, if Marco A and B don't work, again, these are just technology... Sorry, I just hit my mic. These are just technology demonstrators. They are not mission critical. Everything required to help for, for the InSight to land on Mars is all built in all pre-programmed, all already done at this point, you know. So it's it's on its own. We have no control of it from here on Earth. It's it's officially now too late, I believe, to do any updates. So that's been they've had six and a half months of coast phase to really make sure that whole system and, and reentry is going to be just absolutely bang on and it's looking really good. But these CubeSats that are flying along, this is really cool because think about for other missions. You could all you could just send a couple CubeSats with you to help relay the information, to make sure you get good telemetry, get good data all the way through re-entry, not have these blackouts, not have uh, a long upload process and, and have to bounce it off Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, save, you know, blah, 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 upload it to here, do this and send it back off. Hopefully these little guys are just going to do their job. And that's really, really exciting. Um, and by the way, yeah, they have been working this whole time. They have, uh, you know, they have a... a They've been sending data back and forth. They have their own UHF receiver to receive from the InSight lander. They're really cool technology demonstrators. I'm really excited for that. That's going to be – this. that's probably one of the things I'm most excited about for this mission. I think this mission's great, and it's really cool, but that is actually a really surprisingly cool technology. Um, I had someone else in the chat. I noticed someone asked, was this launched by SpaceX or ULA? This was launched on an Atlas V. So they launched this in May. Uh, the beginning of May, out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. It was the first interplanetary launch. The first time anything had left the Earth-Mars, or Earth-Moon system from Vandenberg. Um, and it, it's crazy, because they even were able to launch this thing on the smallest Atlas V. The Atlas V had no solid rocket boosters. It only had a four-meter fairing. You know, it had a single Centaur upper stage engine, uh, which is what all Atlas Vs have been to date. They used the smallest Atlas V, and even though it was launching from Vandenberg, which does not, you know, help with the rotation, you know, doesn't produce any additional delta V, uh, or doesn't give it any additional energy by the, the Earth spinning here. Let me, let me grab one of those globe things and and show you guys what I mean, um, because you do gain a little bit of velocity because the Earth is spinning like this, uh, roughly 1,600 kilometers an hour or something like that, around a thousand miles an hour, and when you launch from Florida or the East Coast or down here, say you're in uh, the, there's the, oh, geez. Where does ESA launch from? The uh, something, something. I'm going to, come on. You guys can, you know what I'm talking about. The, the place that I can't remember right now. Anyway, you do gain some velocity based on the rotation of the Earth. Um, <laughs> no, not Karoo. In, in, in Equi uh, uh, Papua New Guinea. No, uh, what's it called? French Guiana. Thank you. <laughs> yes, too much turkey in my stomach. Uh, so, yeah, so when you launch, like, say, from the French Guiana, you do gain a little bit of extra push from the Earth, and you do not get that when you're launching from, say, the West Coast and you're doing a polar orbit. Uh, you do not get that boost in energy. So even though this launched from California from Vandenberg Air Force Base and went straight south and did not get that boost of the rotation of the Earth, 
it still could get to Mars on the smallest Atlas V. That's just, that shows how small and lightweight and, and well-made this lander is. It's a tiny little efficient lander, uh, you know, not very big. So, yeah. So, there we go. That's that's me flubbing my way through, through French Guiana. <laughs> oh, man. So... I think that's pretty great. I, it was really cool to have a, an interplanetary launch coming from Vandenberg. Uh, I would like to see that again. And if you might be asking right now, why did we do it from there? You know, why why did we launch from Vandenberg when we can just launch and do it from the East Coast? The East Coast is a very busy and complex launch site. There's a lot, especially right now, there's a lot of commercial launches. I mean, SpaceX launches from there about once a month. We have a lot of other, you know, we have the Delta Four and... Atlas V launching from there. Soon we're going to have more and more launches, especially as Blue Origin goes online. So this site's just going to get even busier. And Vandenberg, on the other hand, is not as busy. So really, for something like Mars, you can't be fighting other people. You only have a small window of time, and then you have to wait 26 months again for that window to open back up. So it's really, really, really quite vital that it works out just absolutely perfect. Um... So launching from Vandenberg offers up a little bit of freedom as far as the launch manifest goes. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's why, uh, that's why we do it. Um, yeah. And also there is a Delta four heavy launching from Vandenberg in a few weeks, which is really exciting. There's also a SpaceX launch on Wednesday from Vandenberg. It'll be the first time they reuse a Falcon nine for the third time. This is the third flight of the, of a Falcon nine for the, for the first time, the third time for the first time. I'll be live streaming that, of course. Um, you can, if you don't know when that is, you can go to my website, prelaunch, uh, everydayastronaut.com. Click on prelaunch previews. You get a rundown of all upcoming missions um, and things like that. So, ooh, baby, look at that mission control. We're going to go back. I want to listen in, make sure we're not missing out on anything cool. We're getting close, guys. We're down to 38 minutes. It's a place called Elysium Panicia. Panicia is Latin for flat. Elysium is ancient Greek for afterlife paradise. It's located near the equator, north of Gale Crater, not too far from Curiosity Rover. The team calls it the biggest parking lot on Mars. It's a place Island that's so safe, got plenty of sunshine that will power solar instruments to study Give me that. No matter on what. Mars. It's a place that's safe, Got plenty of sunshine that will power solar instruments to study the interior of Mars. What's inside Mars? We know a lot about what's inside Earth. But at Mars, we've only just scratched the surface. To learn how Mars formed, we have to study its deep interior. NASA's InSight Lander was designed to do just that by taking the planet's vital signs listening for its pulse or seismic activity, including any Mars quakes, taking its temperature to see how much heat is flowing out from deep inside, and checking its reflexes to see how much the planet wobbles as it whips around the sun. These all provide clues to what the planet is really like inside. So what's inside Mars? InSight can help us find out by giving Mars its first thorough checkup since it formed four and a half billion years ago. The more we learn, the better we'll understand all the rocky planets and the history of our solar system. <coughs> Joining us now is Bruce Bennard, the principal investigator of Mars InSight. InSight is him. a mission to Mars, but we keep hearing again and again it's more than a mission to Mars. That's right, Gay. I mean, we're going to Mars, obviously, to study the Martian interior and to, to, to map out the divisions inside Mars, but we want to use that information to understand more about the solar system as a whole and how rocky planets form. And rocky planets, we have an image to show folks. So we're talking about Earth, the Moon, Mar Mars. Mercury, Venus, yes, uh, the, the, the planets of the inner solar system that are made mostly of rocks. And they all show, share the same basic structure with a, a dense iron core, uh, a rocky mantle, and then a, a crust of lighter uh, silicate rocks. But the very details of the uh, thicknesses of those layers, the sizes, and the, the, the 
the uh, compositions um, give us a lot of clues as to how those planets form and why they went down very different paths and into the, the different planets we see today. So explain to me, we are going to have a lander, you're going to be on the surface, how will you be able to study the interior? Ah, well, we use what are called geophysical instruments. They use uh, uh, the principles of physics to actually see through the rocks. I mean, we're using seismic waves, uh, the same way you might use a, a flash bulb uh, to, to, to take pictures of something. We're using uh, Mars quakes, which send out vibrational waves through the planet. And as they go through the planet, they uh, reflect off boundaries. They get uh, bent. They change their velocity. And it changes the um, wiggles that you see on a seismogram. When we uh, go through the planets, you see that here it hits the various boundaries and those waves are reflected, sometimes they're bent. It becomes a pretty complicated uh, pattern, but scientifically we've learned uh, over the, the last 100 years how to interpret the, the, the code of the signal as it comes back up to the surface so cool. and the, seismogram, the seismometers uh, pick up that signal and then turn it into data that we can use on Earth to understand you know, what the 3D structure is of the planet. So normally you use three seismometers. In this case, you're bringing SICE, that's one. How are you going to be able to get that information using one? Good. Well, we had to get kind of clever um, because uh, on the Earth, you know, usually you have plenty of seismometers. You can use uh, multiple seismometers to, to triangulate in on, on where the, the earthquake is. On Mars, we're going to do uh, something a little bit different. We're going to use not only the, the P and the S waves that you may have heard about, but we're using the surface waves. And here you can see uh, the surface waves kind of moving out from uh, Mars quake. And as it passes over the InSight lander, you can see the seismogram up there in the upper left-hand corner uh, where, you, where you have the, the wiggles. Now, those waves keep on going around the planet. And because Mars is not so, so large, um, still have a, they still have a fair amount of amplitude. They're, they haven't gotten completely uh, uh, damped out by the time it's gone all the way around the planet passes over this, the, the spacecraft again, and finally, even the wave that went the other way around the planet uh, comes across and hits us yet a third time. And so we have extra information uh, over just the P and the S wave. We have these surface wave arrivals that we can use to, to uh, pinpoint the distance from the Mars quake to our lander, and then we use uh, something called polarization analysis to figure out which direction the waves are coming from. And by doing that, we can do the same thing that uh, we can do with uh, three stations on the Earth, just using the P and the S waves. And very quickly, there is still another instrument built by DLR that's also being carried up by InSight. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's our heat flow probe. All right, so I want to take this time again to, I'm going to show you guys, uh, I have that video where I'm talking to Bruce. Uh, I actually got to see InSight in person before it took off. It was awesome. Uh, I still am like just absolutely tickled by the fact that I got to see it. Um, and uh, let me let me see where it is here. Hold on. Um, one second here. Trying to find that video. I seem to have closed it. I might just go back to this live stream until I find it. <laughs> um, but for those of you asking, yes, this is live. We are T minus 32 minutes, or not T minus. Uh, but we're 32 minutes away or so from the landing. I'm just going to do this quick. Is a graduate student. The rest of the team hasn't waited quite Sorry that, that long, but this is a big moment for them too. Recently, we sat down with a few of the members and asked them what is it going to be like as we get close to landing. It's a very difficult thing to do, and everything has to go perfectly. As humans, we've sent 17 different missions to the surface of Mars, and 10 of them have crashed. Before we can land on Mars, we have to get to Mars. How do we get to Mars? The main responsibility of the navigation team is to ensure that the spacecraft is delivered to the right point at the top of the Martian atmosphere. The target location is about 12 kilometers in size. 
our accuracy is comparable to shooting a basketball from Staples Center in downtown LA and hitting nothing but net in a basketball hoop in New York City that is moving at a speed of about two feet per second and is spinning about its axis. The landing site, you know, we have an ellipse that's pretty big. It's about 60 miles long. We could land anywhere in that ellipse. There's a chance that we could land right on a rock and we don't really have any control over that. So that's what makes me nervous. We've tested the radar by flying it on a helicopter. We've tested pieces of the heat shield by putting them in an arc jet facility. We've tested the parachute by testing it in a wind tunnel. And putting all that together in a very tightly controlled sequence where every single thing has to go right, we've never tested that. And the first time it's gonna happen is, is once you deliver us to Mars. It is about 11.29 a.m. Pacific, and you're watching live coverage of the InSight landing from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. We are about a half hour away from landing, and people all over the world are watching. Um, take a look at a map that we have for you. We can show you right now. This is a watch in person map where people have watch so parties cool. all over the world, all over the United States, in Paris, in Berlin, even off the coast of Madagascar. And huh. folks in the Big Apple will also be watching today. The NASDAQ tower will switch over to landing coverage for about an hour. That means people in Times Square can watch too. And later today, NASA will have the honor of ringing the closing bell. And that will be a little over an hour from now. And if you are watching, take a picture and send it to us using hashtag Mars Landing. Here is one, I believe it is from the California Science Center in Los Angeles, and I am told Mayor Eric Garcetti will be visiting later today. Things are getting more active for the team now. Let's check back in with Julie Wurzchen in the control room. What's going on, Julie? Uh, yeah, so um, we've heard from MRO a couple of times. That's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. They are doing their slew. They're ready to support us. They're doing great. And we heard from both Marcos, Marco A and B, that they're out there. They're, um, we've got telemetry lock with them from the ground stations here. So they're doing great. And everybody's ready to go. So we're pretty excited. Fantastic. We will check back in with Julie in a moment. So real quick, I want to talk again about why uh, I think that Marco, the Marco A and B CubeSats, they are really, really cool. Again, this is one of those things that I'm almost more excited for than anything because it's such a good idea. Uh, like they said, they mentioned for a second that they're currently able to receive and send information from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. That is one of the spacecraft currently orbiting Mars. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been there for quite a while but it is unable to transmit live data. So it actually has to receive data, turn it, and then push it back out. It cannot send and receive at the same time. It's not made for that. Um, so actually we're seeing a good little animation here. Um, these are the, the Mars CubeSat A and B, or Marco A and B. And these things are only about the size of a briefcase, yet they're able to receive uh, the UHF signal directly from InSight during landing and relay it back to Earth. Now, again, these things, they, they took off in the same upper stage. They, they were dispensed from the Centaur upper stage of the Atlas V rocket that launched them in May. And as soon as InSight kind of uh, payload deployment, the Marco A and B were also deployed. And they are flying basically in parallel, in tandem, with InSight. But the only difference is InSight was able to then, with its own cruise stage, able to lower itself so it just perfectly hits Mars's atmosphere. You know, if it would do it wrong it could go too shallow and and not get into mars uh you know not slow down enough to land on mars if it goes too steep it would burn up on re-entry um or on entry actually it's not re-entering mars just entering mars uh but these marco a and b they're able to actually relay information in real time and these things again they're just the size of a cube they're they're a briefcase and they have enough power somehow to transmit data in real time but there's still an eight minute delay so even though the whole entry uh, from the beginning of InSight hitting the atmosphere to it softly touching down, that's seven minutes of, of terror. And then it will hopefully be sitting there for one minute before we even get the signals that it's started to hit the atmosphere of Mars. So there's seven minutes of terror of re-entry, but then there's also 
uh, eight minutes of delay, and that's if these these uh, Marco A and B CubeSats continue to work as they they currently are working. They're doing a great job. They've had time to test them out all the way all the way to Mars. Basically, they're working phenomenally. Um, th again, they aren't really meant. They they are not mission critical. If the CubeSats fail, no big deal. This is the first time we've ever tried something like this. These are the first CubeSats actually in deep space. We've never sent CubeSats beyond Earth orbit. So these are the first CubeSats that are going to be forever orbiting the sun. But once they fly past Mars, they're they're kind of useless for us. They're only there to really relay information back to Earth, which is really, really cool. Because, again, imagine for future missions now. We can just send a couple relay CubeSats that fly by just like this and provide us with additional and or redundant communications during this process. And that's, you know, if you're landing humans, when we have people going out on a six- to nine-month journey to Mars – and if we lose communication with them, uh, that would be terrifying. So having some redundancy, this is a really, really cool system. I'm really glad they're demonstrating this. I hope this becomes the total norm for Mars uh, missions Makes and any other, any other interplanetary mission. Super cool. Super, super cool. I'm really excited. I did need to give a real quick thank you to uh, all you – jeez, guys. Uh, thank you so much to, like uh, – Dam Damacy, Andrew, Ryan, uh, Johan, N. Ziegel, uh, Viesters, Andre, uh, Hurian, uh, Sedanth, Dudagda, Morgacorn, Linus, Mateo, Chris, and Quiet Storm. Uh, we are 25 minutes away from the touchdown. Let's tune back in, hear what they have to say, hear if anything's uh, changed or anything. But so far, everything is looking great for this mission, guys. My heart rate's going up. My heart rate okay, is going up. Vent pipe. Vent pipe mode will be entered shortly. Okay, thank you very much. And that was obviously our confirmation of the slew for Marco, so that's great news. Fantastic. Um, so I was saying before that the, uh, the NAV2 software will propagate from here on out and we'll use velocity and acceleration. So we have powered off our star tracker and we're on our NAV2 software and everything's looking great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Thanks. All right. The cruise stage separation is just about four minutes away, and Rob Manning joins us now. Rob is the chief engineer here at JPL and an absolute veteran of Mars landings. We're going to play a little video for you right now. You haven't seen it yet, but we'll roll it. Okay, this ahead. is talking this about is Lander is still alive. 14 reports, carrier log, dead. Zero that day, Rob. There you are. You were the phase lead. You were sitting <laughs> up front. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's why it looked like when it's successful. Yes. <laughs> I hate to see what it would be like if I wasn't successful. <laughs> But talk about that. What is EDL like? Why is it so hard? Well, it, it's many years of work by many, many people who struggle to put all the pieces together, and particularly because we can't really test interdescent landing on this planet. It's much more complicated. Um, Mars has a lower atmosphere, thick, thinner atmosphere, less EDL gravity. Com, Marco you com. just can't put the pieces. So it's imagine you had a big Broadway production, Marco B but you couldn't really do the Alpha show until all the audience shows up. So that's what it feels like. So, it's, so you never really know if you've really done it right. Well, we've done it seven times. Can we say that, hey, piece of cake, we know what we're doing? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, it, 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 we get better at it, and there's no doubt. We've learned. We've learned for both the successes and our own failures, including uh, failures of other missions outside of this country. So those pieces come together in our mind's eye. We try to put the, what we learn together and, and just do the best we can. And, and if we don't succeed, we will learn because we are collecting data on the way down. If, we, if something bad happens today, we'll be able to take what we learned. Even though we may fall on the ground after getting kicked off the horse, we'll get back up, brush ourselves off, figure out what we did wrong, and get back on the horse. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty. Just very quickly, give us some possible scenarios of what could happen during EDL today, especially during communications. 
Uh, well, the, 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 the great news about having communications, I, there's almost, uh, almost anything that go wrong, we, there's a very good chance we'll figure it out. But things like, you know, the parachute has to go right. We know you don't open parachutes on Earth going Mach one and a half, uh, one and a half times the speed of sound. You just don't do that. You don't need to on this planet. But we have to because if we waited any longer, we'd be on the ground. A very complicated radar system it has to work from outer space all the way to the ground and look for, this, look for the ground. What if it locked up on the heat shield? Well, we've tried to avoid that problem. We've fixed that problem, we think. Uh, to, uh, to prevent that from happening, but what if we got it wrong? Things like that could could happen, and our vehicle could have things bad happen. Yeah, but right. but we worked hard to prevent them. So at this time, we expect we're getting that close. The we're going to go to the control room for crew stage separation, Rob. Okay. Thank you, Emerald. Want to listen to this? This is the the good stuff here. Oh, I need to. I need to take off. Contact. Give us those facts, everybody. So again, it's detaching from the cruise stage right now. The cruise stage is what's able to make it so it can do any kind of adjustments of its of its altitude, of its of its trajectory. So once that cruise stage is, is detached, it's on a ballistic trajectory. It's just going where it's going. So if it's not directly bang on in the exact little thin portion of the atmosphere that it has to hit in order to make a soft touchdown, uh, again, too shallow, they won't land. <laughs> They'll just go back, go into deep space too steep and it will burn up so this is the cruise stage separation that's that little thing with the solar panels on top it's been with it for the entire six and a half months at this time mro has will have loaded their electro sequences uh, marco is expecting carrier lock uh, at any time marco b is reported there in bent pipe um, still waiting on a copy that thank you Cruise stage, not crew stage. Cruise, C R U I S E, not cruise stage. Good, good question. Radio Science report: UHF carrier detected. EDL con Marco Bravo. Marco Alpha is in bent pipe mode. Marco Bravo has locked on the carrier. Marco Alpha has also locked on carrier. We have both Marco A. The two cubesats are both. Working and, and sending it's data already. That's like phenomenal. As expected, the DSN has LOS for inside expense. Copy that. Thank you. Okay, guys, we're about 20 minutes away from from the reentry sequence happening. Hopefully, we learn more about the exact timing. But uh, it has not landed yet. The cruise stage has detached. It's now uh, heading towards re-entering the Martian atmosphere, and um, it will now be sending UHF or radio frequencies up to Marco A and Marco B, the CubeSats, that flew along with it, so. <sighs> All station, InSight systems on InSight court. DSN has lost the X-band signal from InSight, indicated expected cruise stage separation. So Standing by for UHF signal acquisition via Marco or Radio Science. We are about five minutes from entry and have confirmation we've lost the X-band signal from InSight. This was expected because we have transitioned from the antenna on the cruise stage to the UHF antenna on board the spacecraft. Ground stations have detected the UHF signal and Marco has locked on the signal. This confirms that InSight is transmitting UHF signals as expected. Insight telemetry through the Marco relay is not expected until about two minutes before entry. <sighs> Whose heart rate's up? Mine is. So, Rob, that was exactly what we were hoping to hear, that yes. the Marcos are The vehicle working. has also performed the turn to entry maneuver. The vehicle is turning away from a sun-pointing attitude and oriented itself to enter the Martian atmosphere. Oh, it does have a, a small RCS. Step. That it uses uh, getting, for reentry. You'll see kind the, of those circles the there. stage separated. Uh, it's now. There we go. They're doing those animations of the reentry. Uh, so it still can do some some fine maneuvering, but it's mostly for pointing. It's not necessarily for like full blown, you know, attitude adjustment. Mostly just to make, or it is for attitude adjustment. It's not for like raising and lowering its orbit too much per se. But let's hear what he has to say. Well, it's because the cruise stage has to be pushed off to one side, uh -huh. like this. The rest of the vehicle has to turn to face the atmosphere. And to be dead nuts on as it hits 
hits the uh, the top of the atmosphere. So this Dead is nuts. taking all the heat coming into the atmosphere. Exactly. It'll be both provide a source of drag, but also thermal protection because it gets over 1,500 degrees Celsius on the top of the, on this heat shield. Very very hot. Uh, but on the inside of the heat shield, it may be only a, f uh, a fraction of a few degrees above room temperature. So it's a wonderful protective device to keep our lander safe. All right. So the next thing we're standing by for is is entry, entry. hitting through the going to the top of the atmosphere, and gradually slowing down. Right now, the vehicle's just now beginning to. We'll, very soon, we'll be f beginning to feel the atmosphere touching it. Actually, entry is above the atmosphere slightly, so it's really not until a few. Uh, half a minute or so before, after entry, before we start really detecting the fact that that atmosphere is slowing us down. All right, we'll be standing by. Yes. So just like on Earth, even though the atmosphere is one percent that of Earth here, uh, you know, if you're really, really, really high up, even say the International Space Station, which is about 400 kilometers in altitude, 250 miles in altitude, even up there, it's still hitting trace amounts of atmosphere. The atmosphere doesn't just stop. You know, it's not like here at X at 62 miles or 100 kilometers. It doesn't just stop. It slowly gets thinner and thinner and thinner until there's no discernible atmosphere. That's the same thing with Mars. And even though Mars' atmosphere is crazy thin already, there's still a trace amount as it gets higher and higher. So the InSight uh, capsule is going to be hitting some of this thin atmosphere early on, but it doesn't have enough, you know, it's not compressing enough of that atmosphere to really start slowing it down too much until, they, he said, about 30 seconds into that. So now we just start to wait and start to see if we're going to start getting that data back. Oh, man. Rob, now, entry is scheduled for 11.47. The Two crew minutes. stage SEP and the entry times are locked in, correct? They are. They're locked in when we selected the target and aimed the vehicle very precisely. That allows us to know exactly when we hit the entry point, which is uh, 35, 55 kilometers from the center of Mars. So we know those times are locked in, but what about all the other events that take place in Reggie e Science reports dropping carrier power as Com, expected. Marco A and Marco B have to want to train. Yes. Okay. Just heard both Marcos have telemetry. They are doing their job. These small CubeSats are relaying. And I just wanted to take a second here to, to remind you the scale of this stuff. This has been out. This launched in May from Vandenberg Air Force Base on top of an Atlas rocket, a ULA Atlas ro rocket. Uh, this project has been going on for years and years and years. It was supposed to launch in 2016, and here we are. This was made by Lockheed Martin. Uh, you know, it's coasted for six and a half months on its way to Mars. $850 million project. We're only minutes away from it actually touching down on Mars. This is the first time... Anything will hopefully have successfully landed since 2012. That means the team now can watch the data flowing onto their screens as if they're commuting directly. This data vehicle. will provide detailed information about the state of the spacecraft throughout EDL. Sweet. <laughs> Woo. We were on pins and needles waiting for that because we weren't really sure. Uh, this is wonderful news. Uh, this this will allow us to give some. Uh, if this continues working uh, all the way to the ground and beyond, uh, we, we might even see a, a first picture from the surface of Mars. Yeah, people, I've very soon. I've seen people. Entry on my mark. Here we go. Three, two, one, mark. It's now hit the atmosphere. Here we go. So this is now so officially in a entry. Few seconds. The vehicle will start sensing the atmosphere. I said thirty-five. I've seen people asking, it does have a camera on board, and if Marco A and B CubeSats are able to communicate as it, as it touches down, it will be able to send pictures back relatively soon, uh, a lot sooner than if it had to send it up to Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. But we'll still very, very quickly slow down, and, uh, and, and from 15... In approximately one minute, InSight is expected to reach its maximum heating rate. Oh, yes. Plasma blackout is possible during peak heating and could cause a temporary dropout of telemetry. This could last for as long as two minutes. Yeah, the, the gas that comes off the heat shield as it's slowing down, it looks like a meteor if you're on Mars watching the streak go by. That brightness of gas does interfere with the radio reception. 
And so it's possible that uh, Marco will lose that signal while it's going through this very hot entry. But not to be alarmed. Not to be alarmed. It's, it's part of the design. We, we, we completely expect it. Radio science reports plasma blackouts as expected. Okay. Oh, wow. And again, in real life, all this stuff happened eight minutes ago, but there's an eight-minute well, communications delay. Ground reported from plasma blackout. Still receiving insight telemetry via Marco. Marco Alpha has carrier interruption. Insight should now be experiencing the peak heating rate. Portions of the heat shield may reach nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit as it protects the lander from the heating environment. That's hot. So it is still flying through Michael the atmosphere. Bravo shows carrier interruption, but still in lock. Probably about five minutes or so before it hopefully touches down. No, it has not landed yet, people. It is entering the atmosphere right now. The parachute is going to deploy in just a couple minutes. Hopefully we get the telemetry back and radio Inside call out. passed through peak deceleration. Telemetry shows the spacecraft saw about 8 G. Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo maintain R lock. Radio science reports carrier detected. Okay. So we still have signal from Marco A and B, so Several we're still good. different communications coming in. Inside is now traveling at a velocity of 2,000 meters per second. It seems to have passed this very critical point of peak heating and peak deceleration. The next big step is parachute inflation. And you can see that on our timeline on the bottom of the screen. The next event is parachute deploy. Inside is now traveling at 1,000 meters per second. Once InSight slows to about 400 meters per second, it will deploy its 12-meter diameter supersonic parachute. The parachute will deploy nominally at about Mach 1.7. Okay, here we go. Standing by for parachute deploy. Oh. Should get a call out here soon that the parachute's deployed. Radio science reports a sudden change in Doppler. So hopefully. Ground stations are observing signals consistent with parachute deploy. Marco Alpha, Marco Bravo, maintain lock status. Oh man, here we go. Telemetry shows parachute deployment. Radar powered on. Yeah. Heat shield separation commanded. This is really good news so far. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm on pins and needles. We have radar activation where the radar is beginning to search for the ground. Once the radar locks on the ground and inside is about one kilometer above the surface, the lander will separate from the back shell and begin terminal descent using its 12 descent engines. So it's actually still up in its shell until it gets a good radar track, and then it will drop and just fall without the parachute, <laughs> and then it fires up 12 engines to actually do a soft landing. And that's coming up here any minute. Um, Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes. <laughs> that's good. Standing by for lander separation. Carrier interruption on Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo. Lander separation commanded, yes. altitude 600 meters. Gravity turn, altitude 400 meters. Oh, we're getting there. 300 meters. <laughs> 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 
50 meters, constant velocity, 37 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, 17 meters, standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. 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 Oh, who's got goosebumps? Who's got goosebumps? Congratulations, oh, NASA, JPL, Lockheed oh, Martin, desert, ULA, all those involved. Uh, Control what a room just erupted. Fabulous, fabulous. Hands with the Marco, Marco team there. Oh, Christine, you did great. <laughs> Tim Prizer, one of the key designers at Lockheed. <laughs> Sandy Crabb, what, what a great team. What a great team. This is really fabulous. Fantastic news. So just some context here, everyone. Remember, we're, we're just looking at, at data right now. They're only able to see uh, the call-outs from the spacecraft. Um, the spacecraft having confirmation of, of a landing is, is really all us or scientists really need. Uh, you don't need pictures for validation. Data tells the whole story. But that being said, there will be pictures relayed, hopefully relatively soon, especially if those Marco A and B CubeSats are still in communication. So let's listen in, see if we get any updates. I would love to see some pictures off this thing already. <laughs> they can't help. <laughs> so awesome. Bill Engels taking some photographs. This is, this is the hardest part. Getting to the surface of Mars is very hard. This thing has a lot more to do, though. Uh, it's there's a lot more to, has to go on both today and the, and the days that follow before the science can begin. But, you know, just getting a uh, vehicle on from Earth to the surface of Mars is no mean feat. And, and Rob, could you talk about that? I mean, just the mere accomplishment here that we're seeing. It, it's it, you have to understand that this 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 vehicle is very it's very complicated. Um, it uses twelve engines. Each of those engines are pulsed ten times a second, producing these little tiny uh, impulses, almost like little bullets that keep the vehicle going at a constant velocity as it, as it approaches the ground and still going o over five miles an hour. So those legs feel a fair amount of crush. We still don't know the state of the vehicle right now. We need to look to make sure there are no rocks nearby. The solar panels have to, are, will be in just, in just a few, uh, in about five to 10 minutes, will begin to open up. They're waiting for the dust to settle because the dust were, was certainly a lot of dust being lifted in the air around the vehicle right now, which is now just settling. So we're standing by after touchdown. It waits um, a, a couple of minutes to give us an X band beep. And so we are standing by for that. It's a communication that comes directly to Earth from InSight. Yes. Um, and, and it goes uh, to, to the Deep Space Network. There's also something that might be happening now if we're very lucky. Uh, InSight might be able to relay uh, a, an image or a parcel image taken just a few a couple of minutes after landing. So I'm standing by hoping to see that. But if that doesn't happen, we'll certainly get more images later uh, in our Odyssey Pass in well, about five hours. We see Bruce Banner waiting for it. There they are. They're I, look, they're I don't for, know if they see it they're yet. They're waiting. That's, that's Justin Mackey and Bruce Banner uh, looking carefully at the cameras to see what they might see. Uh, they're now, waiting for the image to come back. So this is the first image from InSight itself. InSight Correct. is taking a picture with one yes. of its two cameras. Yes. It's probably a uh, view of what's directly in front yes. of the spacecraft, right yes. in front of the lander. This is a camera that it would be using to figure out 
is this a good space? Exactly. Is it a good place to put down our instruments? So it is going to take an image and then send that image to the Marcos. The Marcos, in turn, will relay it back down to Earth. That's correct. They got it. Uh, oh, no. Let's see. We're going to see if pictures picture. wait. Let's see what they saw. There it is. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> what? Great. I don't see a lot of. Uh, I don't see a lot of. Uh... Let's explain that image. Now, this image has a dust cover on top EDL of it. EDL com. We have so lost the signal for Marco. You can see potentially a lot of. Uh, uh, radio signs. Reports. Of might be uh, on the camera. LOS for UHF. So we don't know what I'm looking Thank at. Thank you, like... everybody on EDL com. All right. Yeah. Yay, Marco. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, there it is. You can see a better view. You can see that really is debris. And there is the horizon back there, uh, the bluish sky. Uh, uh, that's part of the lander deck on the front left. Um, I can't take out, but it looks like there's not a lot of rocks in the field of view. But those dots you see there are very likely to be dust particles on the, on the lens, the dust cover, the dust which cover. will be removed. After, and we'll and get another shot yes. later on. Yes, um, and amazing. a better, clear view after the dust cutters removed. So, um, it, uh, insights. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, CubeSat's relay communications job is done. They're now flying on. They're now taking pictures back toward Mars. Uh, uh, hopefully, MRO, which flew overhead, might have been lucky enough to capture the descent of this Insight lander on its under its parachute. Uh, while, was, while, while this was going on, it, MRO was flying overhead, recording the data, uh, um, like a, also monitoring the tra transactions and recording every bit of signal it could. And, but it also had the ability to take a picture. And maybe we'll, like we did with, with uh, both Phoenix and later for Curiosity Rover, we might be able to see the parachute inflated That as well. would be fantastic. Cool. We are standing by now for that X-band beep. Yes. Insight phoning home saying, I'm here. And I'm okay. So now switching to a different radio system um, that it can do directly out to the deep space network. Instead of relying on relaying it to those Marco sats, um, Insight should now be able to directly, now that it's on the surface, directly communicate. It shouldn't need uh, those relays right now. So they're switching systems. And we'll hopefully get more telemetry from you know, all the, its current situation here in just a minute and hopefully that dust cap gets removed pretty soon and we get a, another picture without the the dust on it from getting thrown up from those thrusters so system based on inside court the dsn and expand radio science reports expand carrier detected the dsn and expand radio science required the expand touchdown Copy that. Thank you. Flawless. Perfect. Flawless. We've got the beep. We've. Uh, this was perfect case scenario. This is this is what we really hoped and imagined in our mind's eye. Uh, Though we spend most of our looking, visualizing all these bad things can happen. <laughs> That's true. Um, and, and sometimes <laughs> things work out in your favor, and we'll look very carefully at the data to see what might have. Uh, wh how well it went, um, it, it, but it certainly looked like it was a very... My wife poking fun at me and my photography skills, apparently. <laughs> Thanks, babe. I think my first photos, yeah, probably were even worse than that. <laughs> I can't wait to see the, the photos without the dust cover. That'll be great. We'll get a good sense. This is supposed to be a really flat landing area with no big boulders, no big rocks. This is definitely one of those places that we hope to land people someday. It seems really flat really close to the equator. Um, so I'm excited to see uh, photos that, that keep coming out, so. There is no way that any of these engineers could possibly control the vehicle. No. It all has to be done in commands and software. It's, we have to train it to do this work on its own. Uh, radio science reports, nominal carrier, 30 seconds past the first acquisition. 
So we're all nominal on the surface. So the vehicle is completely nominal, reported nominal. Uh, it is, uh, it's happy. The lander is not complaining. Um, we, have a, we had a way to tell us if it was unhappy, uh -huh. uh, and it wasn't. It's not unhappy. It's, quite, it's, it's, uh, it's in a normal mode, uh, and so it's going to chug along for the rest, of the rest of the afternoon on Mars and finish the activities. All right. Well, Rob, I know you're anxious to get in and yes. to congratulate I, I, the crew. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank sitting you. here Thank and helping so us out it explain EDL. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll let you go and go congratulate your friends. Thank you. All right. Take care. That's so awesome. Again, huge, huge congratulations to everyone there and everyone involved in this project. Sounds like just an absolute success. And I owe a real quick thank you to those people that have have sent me tips. I'm just here to help regurgitate whatever uh, they're saying here at NASA. They do a great job of communicating, but sometimes it's, you know, contextually, if you're just logging in right now, it's hard to understand what happened. So let me do a real quick recap. Six and a half months ago, May 5th of this year, um, NASA launched the InSight Lander. It's a, a lander, not a rover, no wheels. It, uh, they launched it on top of United Launch Alliance's Atlas V out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. After six and a half months of coasting, it just now touched down on the surface of Mars. Uh, everything went flawlessly, including an experimental communication system of two small CubeSats that flew overhead during the landing process. This is just absolutely perfect. This is what exactly what you hope for in missions like this. This is a big deal. This is going to be really exciting. We're finally going to study what's below the surface of Mars. We've never drilled deep. This is going five, this will drill five meters to measure uh, below the surface of Mars. This will give us a lot more insight on potential for water, uh, teach us a lot more about the core and, and what Mars is actually made out of. Um, there's a seismometer that will that will measure Mars quakes. They're not earthquakes on Mars. Um, they're Mars quakes. So this is a great mission. Everything has gone absolutely phenomenally we're waiting now um it sent some pictures back uh, a picture back with the dust cover on the lens it also has um big solar panels there's two of them that need to deploy they'll deploy it at six 16 minutes after landing we're waiting on that once those are up this means this mission is just hopefully absolutely on track and then i think we're going to start the science in january so there's a few months of checkouts and all the stuff the the people on this stuff are just brilliant a lot of checks and balances um, making sure everything went well. Um, yeah, thanks, MC Shrimp. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Cliff uh, and and CH Skirt and MC Shrimp, keep up the good work. Again, thank you. And I even helped your wife find you a, a good gift for, your, for, for the holidays. That's awesome. Another win for science. Thanks for covering the landing event. Of course, my pleasure. We're still waiting to hear a few more things. Um, and maybe while we wait for a few more things, uh, why don't I, I'll bring up here real quick. Um, oh, thank you, Robert. Thank you. Um, I'll bring up real quick. You guys were talking about, I do still have 25% off of, uh, on my web store this weekend only, uh, cause it was black Friday and cyber Monday here. So if you guys want 25% off everything in my brand new web store, including grid finata coasters, um, Falcon new, new t-shirts, the Buran pack, these are limited edition. They'll end November 30th. <laughs> We've sold out like over and over and over. Uh, but this will be one of your last chances to get those with 25% off. Uh, moon lamps, all these fun things. Uh, head on over to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Um, also, my music is now live finally. So uh, you can go find it on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music. Wherever you listen to music, just look for Everyday Astronaut. Find the album uh, Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure. It's also available here on YouTube as well in a playlist. So uh, you can check that out. It's a lot of fun to listen to it on YouTube because it's a, um, I have video in the background of the music that lines up. It's really cool, like ambiance. If you're having people over, chill music. If you're trying to study for something, put it on. Uh, I really appreciate you guys pushing me to do that. That uh, was a lot of fun to finally get out. I'll have more music coming out already in the next like month or two because I've got like 20 songs breaking them up into different albums that sound similar. So, yeah, again, check out um, everydayastronaut.com slash shop uh, for lots of new new swag and 25% off using capital G-O, the number four, liftoff, all capital, go for liftoff, 25% off, uh, ends tonight at midnight Pacific, 
Um, so I don't know what time that is. It's like Tuesday, like 8 UTC or something like that. So, yeah, thank you guys for, for all that support. This was a lot of hard work to get online. Just in time, though, for the holiday season. Um, everything you need as a uh, space nerd, hopefully, to show your family and friends. So there we go. Let's get back to the... Let's get back to the stream here quick. I always get lost in my all my millions of windows for some reason. Hold on. Wah, wah, wah. Here we go. Let's hear what they're saying here. Going strong. It's, it's in the, the, what we call the Kuiper Belt now, which is an asteroid belt well beyond Pluto. And it's going to be taking images of uh, Ultima Thule, which is uh, an object in the Kuiper Belt, Kuiper belt which we, we have never been able to go out there and take images of anything at close range before and now we're doing it. So y you ask what's happening next. Uh, <laughs> I'm I got, sorry yeah. I asked. <laughs> we, we have right now at NASA there is more underway um, probably than I don't know how many how many years past but it's like you know there's a drought and then all of a sudden there's all these activities all at once. So we're busy uh, we're gonna be working through the holiday but a lot of amazing discoveries to be made, and we're looking forward to it. It's so funny because our Ask NASA question you basically answered is, does the success of NASA InSight influence the timeline for future manned lunar or Mars missions? Well, certainly everything we learn about Mars at this point is going to help us understand how to do in situ resource utilization. So InSight could actually provide some really good information about whether or not there's liquid water on Mars and maybe even where it is and how to get to it. Um, we strongly believe uh, that there's liquid water, you know, 10 kilometers under the surface of Mars. Um, so the, the, the key is, um, the answer is yes. The more we learn, the more we're able to achieve. Um, and so to get to Mars, yes. But the um, So it looks like people are having, if you're having problems getting into my web store, guys, um, just go to shop.everydayastronaut.com, not everydayastronaut.com slash shop. It should bounce it to uh, another source. It sounds like a lot of people are complaining that the store is down shop.everydayastronaut.com um, and you do have to put the promo code in afterwards uh, at checkout so these are the original prices you'll be able to take 25% off of these a lot of people are talking about it um, yeah so shop.everydayastronaut.com we'll make sure it doesn't crash on you um, and then yeah at checkout you you type in go for liftoff all capital but the number four um, and then international shipping. I know international shipping is expensive. That's why if you spend a hundred dollars in the store, in the store, you do get discounted international shipping or free domestic shipping. So um, if you're in the United States, it is free. Uh, I see a lot of people talking about that. So yeah, now you know. From our missions and build upon those missions. One after another. NASA has a long history of doing just amazing work in building on its past successes and, in fact, its past failures. That's so, true. Um, I, I'll tell you what an amazing time to be at the helm of this extraordinary agency. Well, we are so glad that you are here Thank to share you. it with us. Well, again, Thanks it's for been joining a, us. A true pleasure. Thank All you. All right, me. and I'm sure you need to go in there yes. and celebrate with those folks. But thank you for stepping out for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thank you All so right. much. Take care. Now, Mars exploration is cool stuff, but if you're not convinced just yet, just talk to the Insight scientists and engineers. No one conveys the excitement more than the people who actually work on the mission. So earlier this year, the outreach team filled up a van and went to 15 California cities. They called it the Insight Roadshow. <laughs> so what questions do you guys so have? These are stuff we can all watch later. I want to make sure that you have your answers, your, your questions answered now. Um, let's see. Hopefully... Hopefully the blackout... No, the, the rover did land on Mars already. It is already safe so there's no blackout destroying anything or i don't know what you're talking about blackout there and don't forget the the opportunity rover is still kind of considered alive ish we have not had communications with it for several months now uh, a dust storm did cover its solar panels but then again that rover lasted 14 years and it was only supposed to last 90 days so i think it did okay i think it's okay for the opportunity rover to go ahead and go to sleep uh meanwhile you know Solar panels obviously are a good way to provide electricity and power on Mars. Yes, it's not as efficient. Uh, it's about four times weaker than it is, uh, sunlight is four times weaker than it is here on Earth, thanks to the square inverse law. But it's still a great source of power, and we're getting better and better and better about low power, uh, you know, 
machines like this. You know, we actually have almost no problem these days producing plenty of power out of relatively small solar panels and more and more efficient uh, computers. I mean, look at, look at the Marco A and B sats, the cube sats. Those are just the briefcase size satellites, and they were able to, to relay information on UHF signal and shoot it all the way out, uh, not over UHF, but then shoot it back to, to Earth. It's amazing. Let's listen in here to this interview. Absolutely. I think this is the fifth Mars mission I've worked on. Fifth, really? Fifth uh, Mars lander. So uh, maybe we're getting the hang of it finally. <laughs> <laughs> does it ever get better? I mean, does it get old? Uh, it's always the you same? Know, it doesn't. I mean, I think we're just as nervous every time. Uh, you know, the whole landing sequence, and it's just such a crazy time. And, and you know, we can't do anything. It's this feeling of helplessness, right, because the spacecraft's on its own. And everything we, you know, we could do, we did a day ago. And uh, so I think you just always have that nervousness. But, uh, you know, we have confidence in the team. We have confidence in the engineers and scientists that they did everything that they could do. And, uh, and you have to put it in their hands. And it's our eighth successful landing. So we learn from this. We learn a little more. We do it better the next time, pretty much. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, ha we have had one failure. We learned from the failures, too. So, um, in fact, uh, in, in, we learned from all the failures from all the missions, even if they're not JPL missions or NASA missions. Uh, each one of them tells you a little something, an extra test you should do, an extra thing you should guard against, uh, you know, in the Mars atmosphere or, or on touchdown. And so we've learned from all of these, and uh, luckily we've been uh, we've, we've recently been very successful. And we're always trying something new. We're always trying to learn something new. We had a situation this time. Odyssey couldn't be in place to give us bent pipe communications. And so Marco came about. Oh, the Marco is just an incredible success story. You know, exactly as you said, we, we couldn't have uh, Mars Odyssey. Just so I see people asking, why aren't they streaming, having a live stream from the surface? We don't have the bandwidth for that yet. Someday, eventually, we will hopefully have, you know, communications satellite bandwidth that could do live streaming. That would be amazing. I would love to see that. But we just don't have the infrastructure there yet. There's only a handful of orbiters right now and with very limited bandwidth. But eventually, you know, with better funding increases and more and more interest in this type of stuff, hopefully we can get uh, something like enough bandwidth to do actual full-blown live streams. It would probably take something similar to Starlink um, or some kind of communication network that provides uh, global coverage around Mars uh, with low well not there won't be low latency ever but, but with enough bandwidth to actually produce a live stream because we're in like the k bits per second uh not even close to megabits per second we're down at like very small amounts of data uh it's very slow a live stream just is not capable we are not capable of a live stream right now so um maybe in the future that would be something that we'd be able to do and i would love that especially when we start sending humans to mars hopefully we do have that set up to have a much better transmission of the entire thing because uh, that's going to be pretty important. And I think hopefully by then, yeah, we have like a way better system. So, uh, and also uh, thank you guys to, to Craig and NNNN and Dugata and Robert and Consul and MC Shrimp again and Samuel and on uh, Andreas and Spiral Beard. Thank you guys. Thank you. Relays and not having to depend on a bent pipe from a, a orbiter. You know, they might carry relays. They might actually carry scientific instrumentation. You know, they, they they can do more than just do relay. They can actually take pictures. You know, they they could uh, they could do spectrometry. They could do lots of other stuff that we that we. Uh... So there's a good question. I saw one in the in the live chat there. Someone wants to know where do the cubesats go now. So th since they anything that doesn't either do uh, an orbital injection burn or an aero capture, or something that doesn't slow down when it gets to Mars, will forever be in solar orbit. So those CubeSats never... The only reason that the that the InSight was able to get down onto the ground uh, and be captured by Mars um, is because it entered the atmosphere. And the atmosphere slowed it down enough to make a touchdown. Say this were a, uh, a body that did not have an atmosphere, they would have to do an actual propulsive burn to slow down enough to put it into orbit but uh insight used that heat shield and used this whole edl its entry descent and landing system to slow itself down to at some point it was kind of in orbit really because it slowed down enough to get into uh martian velocity but then it slowed down even further so that it actually ends up landing on on mars meanwhile the marcos a and b the cubesats they stayed out of the atmosphere by a good amount. I don't know the altitude, but it's just doing a flyby of Mars, and therefore those will be out in solar orbit now. For they'll be orbiting the sun forever, and people might be going, "But space junk, 
These things are like the size of a of uh, a briefcase in a space you and I can't even remotely fathom. And there's already trillions and trillions and trillions of pieces of space debris from just the universe, like small meteors and comets and little asteroids that are tiny all over the place. This will not in any way contribute to space junk. Uh, the biggest danger to space junk are things in low Earth orbit. Um, but things out there in solar orbit are no threat to, <laughs> to us or anything. So it's okay to send a couple CubeSats with each launch every couple years to Mars. We're not in any threat. Um, ooh, I want to see if... Okay. Oh, I've seen... This is already available on YouTube. A lot of this stuff, guys, um, they've had videos like this up for months. So if you do want to see uh, these videos... Just search Insight. NASA did a phenomenal job of producing some awesome videos for this uh, for this mission, answering a lot of your questions. Um, I don't want to sit here and replay that. I want to make sure we're answering your guys' specific questions that we have um, about this. And again, someone did mention the Deep Space Network is receiving about one kilobyte. Is it kilobyte or kilobit? Because they're eight times difference. Um, Oh, it sounds like uh, 2,000 kilometers away from Mars' atmosphere. Thank you very much, A-B-O-S-3-O-D. Uh, has the answer of, of um, yeah, of 2,000 kilometers away from, from the surfaces. How high Marco A and B were. So they missed it by a good amount on purpose. You know, they're not meant to re-enter the atmosphere. If they re-entered, not re-entered, sorry. If they entered the atmosphere of Mars, that'd be bad. I'm clear. They would have got very much obliterated in the atmosphere uh, they're not meant for that, so they just did a flyby, um, and yeah, kilobits. Uh, code for the discount again, guys, is go for lift off. Um, yes, for people still wondering, it it did land successfully. Insight has landed. It landed about twenty minutes ago, twenty five minutes ago. Complete success. Everything went perfectly. Let's let's tune in here S real quick. And please. executive board member Hans Jörg Gitas from DLR. So I, I can't imagine a better day. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah, was your really reaction? Day, yeah. So yeah. I am very enthusiastic and very grateful for all the people of the mission and also my thoughts my thought are, are going to the team, the CNES team and to the science team, to Bruce Bannert and to Philippe Lognonet. Now we have a marvelous picture of the ground and now the work to deploy the seismometer is beginning. So a new adventure in the best conditions. Thank you for that. Definitely a new adventure. Hans Jörg, uh, what's your feeling? The HP cubed is on that deck. It will be ready to go. Yeah, it's now. It's now a job now. But first of all, I'd like to congratulate our partners here in the U.S. And this was a great day and a great job they did. It's not easy to land on Mars. That's what we know, and it's a dream for me as well, because the first time that we land on Mars with uh, an instrument as least uh, at least as i has experienced it and so it's it's a great day and um, it was really exciting so far now the job starts for us well it's funny philippe you had once said you're a mu musician as well you're he plays jazz you see exploration and music very similar yeah <laughs> how's yes, that very similar because the human uh, management of all that activity is exactly the same the technique it's different you have a siphometer and you have a, an orchestra. <laughs> but the whole thing to find the best talent trying to find new pictures like that are exactly the same. And to deliver on time, to be ready, and to have the best performances. Everything is similar. And we should let people know that we won't be able to be collecting science right away. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. We will be collecting science, what, several months from now? We are beginning. The deployment is going to take about two or three months. Of course, we will have some data during the deployments, but the it's best data to make the best science. We've got a lot of people act, uh, asking about the picture. Let's go ahead and take a look at that picture. Um, I'm going to pull it up here real quick, or try. I actually don't know a good way of doing this without it looking really funny for a second. So, one second here. Um, hopefully that's okay. And check this baby out. Look at that. Yes. So that's actually pretty high res. Uh, again, you can see a lot of the um, a lot of the the dust on the the dust cover from when it propulsively landed. It does shoot up a lot of dirt and dust right onto the surface. Look at that, though, man. So you can see what looks like a rock right there. 
Landed really close to a, a stray rock. I can't wait until this dust cover comes off. Um, down in the lower right, down there, it looks like we see, I think that's probably one of the landing legs. This appears to be a rock right here. Um, and then all those big black dots, those are, that's just dust. And that dust cover will pop off and we'll start getting clean images from the surface. Um, but again, this is not a rover, so it's not going to move around. So this will be the pictures it takes for the rest of its life. But um, yeah, pretty great. Pretty great. Um, yeah, uh, let's do this. I'll bring back the live stream here. Um, all looks like they're just doing something. I'll keep answering some questions. Um, thank you, Spiral Beard, again. Um, I will be doing the SpaceX launch on Wednesday. Um, absolutely, SpaceX is launching on Wednesday out of Vandenberg. It's the third launch of the same rocket, so second time they're reflying a rocket. This is the first time... They're flying a rocket three times, reflying it twice, if that makes sense. The first time they're ever reflying twice a rocket, which is really, really exciting. Um, that's happening on Wednesday. You can join me Wednesday afternoon, my time. Probably, I think it's around like 20 UTC or something. Uh, if you want to know the exact time, go to my website, everydayastronaut.com. Um, click on pre-launch previews. You'll see it there. Um, that'll show the time in your local time zone of when that SpaceX launch will be. So, of course, I'll be live streaming that. Um, Martin... Is there any way of watching a SpaceX launch in real life? Of course, absolutely. And us, you're from the Arctic Circle in Norway. I have a video, um, best places to watch a launch in Florida. Uh, it tells you at least where to launch, watch launches in Florida. I'm, I need to do one for Vandenberg as well, because Vandenberg's starting to launch more and more. Um, but you can easily watch launches. Florida has the most launches, so if you want your best odds of actually catching a launch live, go down to Florida. Like, if that's your goal, if you're like, I want to see a SpaceX launch in real life with my own eyeballs. Florida is definitely going to be better than the West coast. Um, but although the West coast has been having a lot of activity lately. Um, but yeah, um, I have a, or if you just search best places to view a launch in Florida, you shouldn't find my website. Um, it should be one of the top results there. And I, I map out where you can see it from uh, and talk about all those different things. And also I have a video showing the different vantages and all that stuff uh, here on YouTube. So you can search for it there. Uh, and thank you for your tip. And Marcus, so the peanuts did work. It does appear that way. It sure does appear that way. Um, Jan wants to know when the next Falcon Heavy will launch. Um, it's in 2019. I think we're seeing around February or March. Uh, I, I haven't seen an update in that schedule yet. It's just kind of on the books, but we don't really have anything definitive yet. And when you're this far out for something like Falcon Heavy, you just kind of got to wait um, because any date right now is sort of... It's hard to tell. So thank you, Jonathan. And also thank you, Velocity. So after this, the CubeSats have no purpose. That's that's correct. Although they are testing out, we'll be able to test out how long they work for, you know, how far a little tiny CubeSat can actually continue to transmit data. Since these are the first CubeSats in deep space, it, they still offer some, that's, you know, kind of a valid thing to do is to still check out everything. So um, although they, they're done with the Mars portion of their mission, there's still a good technology demonstrator to see going forward if CubeSats are a valid option for communications in deep space uh, purposes. So, yeah, they kind of don't have a, a purpose anymore, but it's okay. They did a great job. Um, and they were, compared to a, a normal communication satellite, very inexpensive and very lightweight and a great, great uh, piece of technology to have. So, um Will I be live streaming DM1 launch? Of course. Hopefully, I will be there in person. That's one that I don't want to miss. Uh, so plan on me being there. I'm working on a brand new live stream setup that will be absolutely amazing for launching, uh, for broadcasting from the Cape. So uh, fingers crossed that that all goes very, very well. Um, can we buy CubeSats on my shopping channel? <laughs> Maybe. Um <laughs> I actually, we, we might be doing something like that someday, believe it or not. I know it sounds ridiculous, but yeah, we might have something like that for you guys in the future. Um, so yeah, and this, let's see. So I think they're kind of wrapping up here. I, I'm going to wrap up because I actually have a lot, <laughs> a lot that I'm working on. I have been working on a, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I've been working on the same video for like three months. I'm like over 25 pages in, of scripting all together. Uh, it's going to end up being four videos and these are all canceled missions. I'm really excited to get this video out there because um, it's, it's like, I only did canceled missions that were like 
almost done or even flew in some points or definitely had hardware built or cool technology that was like canceled, even though it was totally ready to go. Uh, it's going to be a really good set of videos. So stay tuned for that. Um, I'm going to get to work on that right away. I think I'm going to start shooting the first uh, two versions of it now. Meanwhile, I have like a whole list, like literally 40 or 50 video ideas that I need to get out. So I'm going to be cranking these out. December is going to be my month of all the content. So get excited, get ready. There'll be tons of videos coming your way. Lots of, I have some awesome topics that I'm really, really, really excited about. Um, and also Jonathan, you're here with your son, Zave. Hey Zave, in your words, what's the, what's the importance of this mission? Well, thank you, Jonathan. And, and thanks Zave. Um, the importance of this mission is we can finally find out what Mars is actually made of. We actually will get a better understanding of Mars from this mission than a lot of other missions. Pretty pictures and stuff are great. You know, getting some of that data back from all the other missions is great, but actually drilling down inside of Mars will tell us a lot about Mars. A lot more than I think uh, some of us really give credit. So it's it's going to be um, really, really, really awesome to get all that that science flowing. So it's it's important to learn how Mars is made. If we understand what Mars is made out of, how it's formed, we can compare it to Earth. It's just another another complex set of, of data that we can compare to our own planet to help understand how everything's made in the universe and what, what the rest of the universe might be made out of, how things were formed. Um, you know, if you only have one narrow set of data on your own planet, it's hard to understand what the rest of them are, are made out of. So gathering data from other planets is a great thing, helps us understand how the universe is made and formed and all that. So it's a pretty exciting and, and important mission. So, um, and thank you, Kaveric, uh, uh, Kaveric. Um, yeah, guys, um, I thank you, Marcus. You're welcome for the stream. It's my pleasure. I really, really, really enjoy this stuff. This is, this was huge. This was a, a huge day for NASA and JPL and, and Lockheed Martin and ESA, all those involved in this mission. Man, uh, it is awesome. And Mark, Mark boys, can they retract the solar panels during a dust storm? If you don't know, well, I find out, I don't know offhand. I don't know if they're meant to be retracted. Um, the problem is even if they were retracted, they're, they're in an accordion shape. So they'd probably just sit there and collect dust. And then if you fold them back out, I don't think they have a way of tilting over, you know, like to empty out the dust. So I don't think they have a way to retract for a solar storm. These really aren't meant to last like a decade. You know, these are, this mission is, I don't, don't remember the planned duration, but I think it's only a couple of years. It's not very long. Um, solar dust or Martian dust is an issue, but again, it, look at, you know, opportunity was there for 14 years before it ran into a real problem with solar, with, with Mars dust. So, um, <laughs> Chris Harris, aw, shucks. Um, yeah. So will there be a Mars lander party where they all come together? I hope so. Hey, why did Nightbot delete that? Sorry. Oh, cause it was all capital. Sorry about that. I do hope so. Curiosity and insight are actually pretty close. I still think it would take, you know, like 10 years for Curiosity to drive over to Insight, which I don't think it has the the RTG battery and capability, electrical power left over to ever do that. Um, when will we see Marco Polo shirts in your store? That's a great idea, Johnny B. That's funny. <laughs> I'll work on it. I need some dress shirts in my store. I really want, like, dress wear because I wear, like, nicer things than T-shirts all the time. You know, again, this is... My favorite T-shirt, the F1 uh, engine shirt, is uh, is my favorite one personally, and apparently all of yours because that's like you guys buy a ton of those. Um, but I, I really want more dress shirts because I, I wear dress shirts often, and I like to have space themed dress shirts. So maybe that'll be maybe that'll be coming soon. Um, yeah. So thank you guys again. Um, yeah, you guys are awesome. I really really appreciate everyone. Uh, coming by and asking me questions. It was a lot of fun. I'm going to just be smiling the rest of the day and I'm going to be shooting this video today with a, a little bit of extra space enthusiasm because this is what it's all about here, people. We're getting science from another planet. Like we have new scientific instruments on the surface of Mars and that is just, that's insane. Like when you think about how far, oh, the people that figure this stuff out and how to do it and make it happen, you guys, hats off to you guys. You guys are amazing. Ray, I'd buy an EDA dress shirt in a harpy. I need, I will. I'm working on it. I just don't have a very good way of figuring out how to do all that stuff. Um, so join me, guys, uh, at Gridfin Waffle Irons. Yes, I want Gridfin, not a waffle iron. 
or maybe grid not a grid fin waffle iron <laughs> yeah we need some of that um yeah so again one last time if you guys haven't checked it out this is your last chance to uh to save 25 percent off my entire store uh using uh go for liftoff that's g capital g o the number four and liftoff all capital um go for liftoff uh put that in when you're shopping uh, at, at checkout, you'll be able to do it. This is the last day. It ends at midnight tonight, uh, Pacific time. Uh, that cu coupon expires as Cyber Monday ends. So yeah, 25% off everything. So yeah, that's quite good. So get it while it lasts. Again, uh, free domestic and discounted shipping on all orders over $100. And while you're there, be sure and check out. You can listen to it for free here on YouTube. Um, but I have my first album out. Uh, maximum Aerodynamic Pressure. It's seven songs. You can get it on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play Music, uh, Amazon Music, wherever you find, wherever you listen to music, you can click on these links or if you just search wherever you do listen to music, uh, you can find Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure there. But just search Everyday Astronaut or Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure. Hopefully you find it. Um, yeah, thank you for everyone that encouraged me to do that. Oh, but yeah, it's, and oh, speaking of exams, listen to it while you are studying for your exam. I promise it'll hopefully help get you in the mood to do some good studying. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. And huge congratulations to Insight and all those involved. Very exciting. Can't wait to see the science coming from this thing. So, all right, everybody. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, guys.